Wonderful. Let me see. Yeah, we do have a core group that's already here. Uh, and I don't want to take people, um, I, I'm sensitive to time. Okay, so good morning, everyone who has joined this morning. Um, welcome to uh, another CAMS program designed to help all of us uh, address the COVID situation as a community and be mutually supportive to each other. We have uh, an amazing program set up this morning geared, uh, and tomorrow night, geared around resilience specifically. We have four speakers this morning. Um, Haley Hoffman, who is, uh, has a master's and is a, a licensed uh, clinician in Imago Therapy, who's gonna be speaking to us. Stuart Rosenthal, who is the publisher and editor-in-chief of The Beacon, the senior beacon, is gonna be speaking about seniors um, today. Uh, Sharon Freundell is going to give us a Torah perspective. She is the um, managing director of the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge, and uh, and all of us uh, will be listening for her words of wisdom from Torah. And then, last but not least, Dr. Alana Fine uh, is a clinical psychologist in private practice who's going to talk to us about eating um, and eating disorders, uh, and and not actually disorders. She's going to actually talk to us about how eating has become an important uh, part of what we've done. It's not been necessarily so healthy for us in coping with COVID-19 and what we can do to address um, eating issues uh, in this space. Uh, so with that, I want to um, start by introducing our first speaker is Haley Hoffman. She is joining us. We're very uh, grateful that she is joining our community and giving us her wisdom. Um, she is a psychodynamically trained clinical counselor, focusing on helping couples and individuals live relationally and navigate life's terms. She, her practice is rooted in unconditional positive regard, creating a safe haven for exploring vulnerability and change and a spiritual approach to life's up and, ups and downs, drawing on lessons she has learned in Imago therapy, 12-step work, and psychodynamic clinical theory. Um, after obtaining her master's in clinical counseling from Northwestern, she became a certified Imago relational, relationship therapist. And today, she's going to introduce to us the basic concepts of Imago relational therapy, along with a simple practice for us to foster connection that encourages stability and safety during stressful situations like COVID-19 or conflict by engaging in self-regulation. So, oh, I apologize. You're right. I'm supposed to introduce the rabbi first. I apologize everybody right off the bat. Haley, I introduced you. I'm going to put you on pause because, of course, this wonderful okay. opportunity shouldn't begin without talking to the rabbi. My apologies, rabbi. Don't be silly. It's totally fine. And I'm, I'm excited to hear the speaker. So, uh, I won't take too long, but first of all, thank you, Laura. Um, thank you to Rhonda and to Tamara and to Arya Shadovsky for all their help in organizing this fantastic program. It's one that's so meaningful and so necessary. Um, thank you, Laura, for uh, agreeing to moderate today and Sharon Maisel for tomorrow. Uh, thank you to our mental health team at KMS, uh, which has been really an invaluable resource to all of us during this pandemic. And thank you to all of our speakers for taking the time uh, to present to us here and to be a support for us. I just wanted to share one idea that maybe would frame today's discussion. Uh, this week of Tisha B'Av, uh, as much as we think about mourning and destruction, our eyes are already set towards the afternoon of Tisha B'Av when we recite Nachem and to the Shabbos that follows, which is Shabbos Nachamu, where we're looking for comfort and consolation. What's interesting is that if you think about the usage of the word Nachem um, or Nechama in the Torah, uh, it doesn't only speak about the result, meaning a person being consoled, but also I think speaks to the way that we achieve that consolation. Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch very famously explains that Nachem, or Nechama, actually comes um, from the definition of a change of perspective. It's not just about consolation, but about change of perspective. For example, at the end of Parshas Gracious, uh, as the world descends into immorality, uh, the Torah says that, uh, according to Hashem, Nicham tiki asitim, I was Nachem that I created them. Now over there, Nachem cannot mean I was consoled that I created them. It's the opposite. God is disappointed that he creates them. He's regretting that he created the world. And so Rav Hirsch explains that in that example, you can see Nachem sometimes doesn't just mean consolation or comfort, but actually means change of perspective. In this case, a negative one. Hashem had a change of perspective on the creation of humanity. But from this Rav Hirsch and other Mepharshim, you see that the true definition of consolation in our tradition is not to scrap the reality that you're in. 
and fly off to some fantastic land in which everything is perfect and wonderful and free of challenges, but actually to take challenging situations that you're in and find a way to cope with them, find a way to think about them, find a way to talk about them, find a way to see them from a different perspective. And perspective taking, taking a step back from things to think about our challenges, can itself be a source of nechama, a source of hope, a source of comfort and consolation, even before anything is actually resolved. And while that's true of nechama that we seek on a national level this week as we approach Tisha B'Av, it's also true on a personal level as well. Each of us struggles with different life challenges, and we can sometimes, I think, find a measure of relief and comfort just by trying to think about our challenges and talk about them and see them from a slightly new perspective. And I really believe that today's conversation is an important tool in doing just that. I think these conversations today will provide us with a chance to see issues a bit differently, to take new perspectives, to see from a different vantage point that can hopefully help us to find a measure of nechama, of comfort in some of the more difficult situations that we are facing uh, nowadays in our lives. So thank you again for everyone uh, for participating and for being here. We hope that all the individuals and that our nation as a whole and the world as a whole should find uh, nechama, should find comfort and consolation and a healthy change of perspective that perhaps allows uh, for some accommodation to the new realities that we face in life. Thank you so much, and I hand it back to our. That was a perfect segue, I think, for you, Haley, about change in perspective. So with that, please take it away. Thank you so much. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for inviting me to join you this morning. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Imago Relationship Therapy, Imago is the brainchild of Harville Hendricks and his wife, Helen LaKelly Hunt. Their own marriage was the crucible in which they created this concept of moving from an unconscious relationship into a conscious relationship. And Imago Dialogue is the key tool that couples use to explore and build this connection between each other. It's the space between us that we really want to be able to focus on because there's always energy in that space between us. So one of the key ways that we teach couples how to do Imago Dialogue is to use um, what we call an appreciations dialogue. And my husband has joined me here this morning, so I'm going to invite him to do an, an Imago appreciations dialogue with me as a very quick demonstration for you. So whenever you're ready, David, um, are you available to hear my appreciations for you? I am. So I really appreciate, first of all, that when I told you that I was doing this, you said, oh, I'd really like to join you. Um, would that be okay? And you did. So what I heard you say is that when um, you mentioned to me that you were going to do this, uh, my reaction was, oh, that sounds great. Can I join you? Did I get that? You certainly did. And when you did that, I felt supported. I felt um, loved and I felt um, really like you got me, like you understood that I was doing something and that, that having you at my side to do it would also be really helpful. And um, when um, I said that, you felt loved and supported and um, you felt like I got you, that I, that I understood how important this was for you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Would you like to do an appreciation? I would. Um, I really appreciate how um, not just enthusiastically supportive you've been to the stuff I've been doing in the garden, um, but how you've actually, you know, adopted it and become a partner and um, that it's something we do together. And I, I love the fact that um, the, our default seems to always drift towards finding interests that we love to do together. So what I heard you say is that you really appreciate both my enthusiasm, but also my willingness to join you in the garden, that, that our default is that we do things together and the garden has been one of those things. Am I yeah. getting it? Yeah, and, and, and when you do that, I feel like um, I have a partner and I'm not alone in this. Mm -hmm. So when I do that, you feel like you have a partner and you're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for telling me. 
So that is a simple appreciations dialogue, and it is the basis of what David and I do on a, on a regular basis. We give, give each other sort of those moments throughout the day and throughout our week of things, oh, thanks for doing that, and I really appreciate that. But we set aside time every Sunday morning in which we take the time to go through our week and notice all the different behaviors, all the different things that we said to each other that we appreciate and the emotions that are associated with them. That is the key piece to staying connected. And when I'm working with um, couples in Imago therapy, it's the thing that I say to them, if you do nothing else, if you take nothing else away from what we're doing here, that's the thing that I want you to take. Try to incorporate an appreciations dialogue into your regular practice because we get good at the things that we do. And the more we do it, the better we get at it. And at the end of an appreciations dialogue, I then also have my couples do a one minute silent hug. I'm inviting them to look for each other's heartbeat, to breathe together, and to just hold each other, to just be in that space silently. And I tell them to set a timer because a minute is a lot longer than you can imagine. <laughs> And the reason that we do this, and this is part of, of everything that I'm going to be talking about today, the reason that we do this is because the brain will begin to produce dopamine at about 30 seconds. And at 40 seconds, it will release dopamine. And at, at 60 seconds, you begin to feel dopamine or oxytocin in your body. And it's just a feel-good thing. We need more feel-good hormones running through our bodies all the time because we have a natural um, inclination to be um, looking for the negative in the world, to have a negative bias. It is the way we are because that's what helps us to survive. And so we need to counterbalance that, that natural negative bi uh, bias of, is this okay? Am I safe? Is everything good? By actually creating oxytocin and dopamine in our systems. So it's part of what I suggest to couples to, to get you started on this path of staying connected. We, in Imago, we would say that you move through, um, you know, three stages of a relationship at least. And the first stage being good relations. You, you fell in love with somebody, you, everything looks good, you're attracted to them, everything is happy, all the things about them that they do are fine, and then something happens. And all those things become irritations or they show up as something that bothers you. And that gets to be the stage that we would call the, the um, power struggle. And in that stage, the possibility of ruptures occur. And this is for every relationship. We start with good relations, we move into ruptures, and the goal here is that we are capable of repairing so that we can return to the good relations piece. So I'm going to come back to that, but I want us to be thinking that it's normal. That's what's going on. And so for those of us who are, are experiencing the ups and downs of our relationship right now, the, the most important thing is to be able to consciously reconnect in that um, space of repair so that we can move back into the good relationship. So one of the things that you noticed that David and I may have been doing is that we mirrored each other. Using each other's words as much as possible, we mirrored what the other person was saying and checked to see, am I getting you? Is that what you were saying? And, and that simple process of what many of you may think of as active listening and what I think of as generative listening is the thing that is most important for us to be able to stop and slow down. We're slowing down our brains. We're slowing down our um, parasympathetic nervous system. We're slowing everything down so that we can actually hear what's being said. And if possible, I invite my couples to hear it with your heart and not with your brain. Our brains are just so logical and they wanna put everything into little boxes. So hear it with your heart. Mirroring is a critical piece because it helps us to actually rewire our brains so that we, we can actually have a new pathway. Instead of just having that negative bias, we develop this positive bias. And that new pathway becomes an option in moments of crisis, in moments of stress, in moments of possible conflict. We can say to ourselves, do I need to go to that negative place where survival is going to rule everything? Or can I go to that positive place where connection can rule everything? It is easier to stay connected than it is to reconnect. 
But learning to reconnect is critical for all of us. So one of the ways that I encourage clients to um, uh, Stay connected is what I call five times a day. And I think it's, it's, it's very convenient that we have five fingers so that we can count these five times on our fingers. So the first connection that I want people to have is when you wake up in the morning. The first thing that you do when both of you are awake in the morning is to greet each other with love, to have some way of saying to each other, good morning, oh yeah, it's you, I love you, and just to have that moment. The second time, and this, this second time has, um, uh, been hugely disrupted in the life of um, the, the pandemic. But the second time is how we leave each other in the morning when we go to begin our day. And even though David and I have not left our house essentially for five months, we do go to our separate spaces to do our work during the day because both of us are able to work full time during this time. So when we leave the breakfast table and I go upstairs to my office and he leaves to go upstairs to his office, we take a moment to say goodbye and have a good day, to get, kiss each other, to hug each other, to say I love you. Just some moment of I'm sending you off to the work that you do that is so important so that you can be in that space knowing that I'm with you. The third time of the day, and again, things have changed because now we often do this third time in, in person, is sometime in the middle of the day to check in with your partner. You can do it any way you want. In the old days, we used to text each other or call each other. These days we meet for lunch because here we are. <laughs> and so at some point we just check to see how's your day going? How are you? Sometimes it's, it's David sending me um, an article. Sometimes it's him sending me a meme. Sometimes I send him a text message. It, it, it can, even though we're in the same house, we just look for a way to reconnect with each other to say, hey, I'm here, you're here. I just want you to know that I know you're there, okay? The fourth time, and I don't think it is any mistake that the fourth time is actually um, on our ring finger. The fourth time is how I reconnect with you at the end of my day as I'm coming back into our relationship and leaving whatever it is that I've been doing all day long. And my piece here is to, to create some moment of just transition for yourself in which you can just look back through your day and say, what was the best thing that happened to me today? What was the best part of my day? So that when you come back together, that is what you greet each other with. The best part of your day is the way in which you start what you're doing. And with that best part of your day, you know that there are other things that have happened. Things, there have been ups and downs because that's what life is like that you're going to get to talk about. But the energy that you put into the space between the two of you when you come back together is positive energy, is affirming energy, is aspirational energy. And that has value. That has value in the connection being a stronger, more stable thing. And then the, the fifth time of day is, of course, when you go to sleep. And some people are really fortunate, and they're both on the sleep, same sleep schedule. We're both, you know, going to go to bed at the same time. We get into bed together. We have our night ritual. And, and it, it works to just turn to each other and say, I love you. Sleep well. Some of us are not as fortunate. And, you know, if some people have a partner who stays up later or um, is getting work done because you've been with children all day long and you need to get a little bit of time to yourself to finish some of that work that you didn't get to do, then one of you might be going to bed before the other. And my advice on that is to go to the person who is working or is staying up and to say to them, I'm going to bed. And that person who is working or is staying up, it is their responsibility to get up and say, let me just take you in my arms and say goodnight to you. And then to go your separate ways, to stop whatever you're doing and make space for the relationship to just have a moment to say, I'm reconnecting with you before we go off into the unconscious world of our sleep. So that's my five times a day piece. And it is just one of the ways that I, that I suggest that we make a practice that becomes who we are as a regular way of consciously connecting with each other. Another thing that I, I try to say to my couples is, um, look for what is right about us. That is the thing right at the moment where there's so much that we feel is just wrong, wrong with the world, wrong with our city, wrong with our community, whatever it is, the things that we're disagreeing with, the things that we're, we're seeing that are, are triggering us, the things that are um, raising levels of outrage that we might feel. 
those things are going to be there and that we have to consciously say to ourselves, I'm going to look for what is right. First and foremost, what is right for me with me? What is right for us? What's right about us right at the moment? What are we doing well? The reality is that we do well at all kinds of times in all kinds of situations in our relationship. And the way that we do well is because we consciously do things to do well. The problem with that is when we've been doing well for a little bit of time, we stop doing the things that we were consciously doing that made it possible for us to do well. And so the question that you need to ask yourself when things are looking wrong or things are looking bad is what were we doing when things were going well? What is right about us right now? And to be aware that our differences, there's a, a researcher um, named John Gottman who has um, come to the conclusion that 67% of the differences that we have with our spouses or our partners are unresolvable. And that's the good news because the differences we have between each other help us to be individually ourselves. And I have a, a, a friend and colleague who says that if we were too much alike, one of us would be redundant. So in this space, we get to be different, we get to celebrate each other's difference, we get to grow from each other's differences, and those differences are good. Those differences are the heart of who we are. Another thing that I say to couples is ask for what you want. If I am in this space believing that I can in, um, anticipate or intuit what my partner wants, chances are I've been with him a while, I know him well, chances are I'm gonna get it right periodically. But if I assume that role and he then gets to you know, be dependent on that, then I am both preventing him from developing his ability to ask for what he wants. I'm interrupting his, his desire for it. It shifts the way in which we work with each other. And so my job is to always ask for what I want. It may not be what I'm going to get in that moment. It may be that I don't have that at this moment. And I may need to go someplace else to ask somebody for what I want. Maybe I need somebody to listen to me who isn't distracted by what's going on at the moment. And that's okay. I can go someplace else. But asking is my job. The asking is the important piece here. And, and the practice of asking for what you want is something that we all need to develop because secretly in our hearts, we want people to, to read our minds. And David and I often talk about, um, you know, that, that possibility that I will get into my head. I will start having a conversation in my head about something that, that I need to be talking to him about. And he will look over and he will see me doing that. And he will think to himself, hmm, I wonder how that's going. And then he'll say, how am I doing in there? And then I will have to say, not very well. So if I can bring that conversation out into the, the um, space between us, that is how we were actually going to be able to navigate the things that are going on. And asking for what I want is me practicing that. Me being able to say, oh, I should say this out loud and not just wish for it or not just hope for it or not expect him to, to just know that that's what I need or want. That will help me in those times when we are in stress and I am you know, slipping into my head to have the conversation without him. So that process of dialoguing, being able to talk to each other with mirroring, being able to do appreciations dialogues, being able to connect with each other in all different ways, the, all of those things are the positive things that, that we consciously do in our relationship. One of the things that I have been doing in the course of, of um, the pandemic is um, I've been hosting with David a um, couples group. And the, on Wednesday nights from eight to nine, couples come to our Zoom room and we talk a little bit about how everybody's doing. We, de de David and I demonstrate a positive um, dialogue. So it's a topic like, um, you know, your favorite dream date or your, um, uh, the vacation that you're longing to go on or um, the, the um, uh, personality traits about you that I am um, most um, attached to and I love, you know, 
just fun, positive things. Um, retelling how we met. Tell us the story of how we met. And so he and I will demonstrate that. And then everybody goes, you know, turns off their microphones. And in the privacy of their living room, they have that dialogue with each other. And then they come back into the room and we process it together. It's one way of us building a little bit of strength around this, building a sense of community, of couples being able to just say, oh yeah, we're all we're all in this together. We're all experiencing our own and our and the same ups and downs. And, um, you know, it's just nice to see people say there's space for that positive. So the space for the positive brings me to the second part of what I want to share with all of you. And that is the idea of heading off the, the negative experience in our in the space between us before it happens. And again, this comes back to our, our healthy interactions start with good relationships, the, the inevitable rupture from um, you know, rejection, from misunderstanding, from miscommunication occurs, and then we come to repair. And it's in the rejection sp space that emotional self-regulation is the most important thing that we can think about. Emotional self-regulation is the idea of being able to take a deep breath, to recenter yourself, to notice that you're having a reaction and to be able to actually stop yourself before you act in the way that you ordinarily act when you are having a reaction. What, what, the way I, I map it in, in my brain when I can look back on it, because this all happens in you know, a split second and frequently I have to do this um, in hindsight. So I would, would form a dialogue from in my head that I would have with David, which would be something like, I notice I have a reaction when you, and it fill in the blank, when you leave your socks on the floor. And the story I tell myself is that you think it's my job to pick up your socks. And when I tell myself that story, I feel um, taken advantage of, I feel um, unimportant. And when I feel taken advantage of and unimportant, I am likely to um, pick up the socks really angrily and throw them in the hamper. And when I do that, I do that because, and then I wanna explore a little bit about what's going on with me. They're just socks. What's the problem with the socks? And so when I can have that conversation with myself, I can then take that to David and have that conversation with him because the way I'm responding to him is about me, not about him. And the socks are just an excuse for me to be in that space. So when I have an opportunity to be aware of what's going on with me, then I can actually change the way that I behave. It is easier for us to change the way that we act than it is to change the way that we think or the way that we feel. But thinking and feeling can follow actions, okay? And so I can change my action and therefore my feelings about what's going on internally will shift and the way that I think about David will shift. And that will change everything about the space between us. We use the mirroring in part to co-regulate. We use the mirroring to slow down because it gets us to actually give our bodies a chance to catch up to what's going on chemically. It takes about 20 seconds for cortisol, uh, for um, the stress hormone to be released into your body. And when cortisol is released in your body, you, you immediately begin to shift into fight or flight, um, Adrenaline might actually join that. Your body is off to the races before your brain has actually caught up to it. And that, that motion of moving you into action actually then keeps you going on that path. And so changing what you're doing can slow that down. There are four hormones that we think of as the um, sort of happy hormones. And those four hormones can also help us to reset our parasympathetic nervous system. And so um, this is the last piece that I wanna share with you. Um, the four hormones are um, dopamine, dopamine, which is associated with pleasure, reward, and achievement. And so when we want to cultivate dopamine in our bodies, we need to actually cultivate positive thoughts Sharing appreciations is a great way to do it. Envisioning um, the future in affirmative and aspirational ways, all of those kinds of things can help to produce dopamine. So plan that vacation that you wanna take in three weeks, even if stuff happens and it doesn't happen. 
plan it anyway, dream about it, put it on the horizon and talk about it. Have a practice of daily appreciations with each other so that you, you can actually cultivate the production of dopamine in your brain. And the brain can actually calm down. Your body can actually join together so that we can integrate both the brain and the body together. Oxytocin is the love hor hormone. It's nature's way of saying you are meant to be get together. You are meant to procreate. You are meant to be a partnership. And it is um, uh, the easiest thing to do in the giving and receiving of tender touch, of gentle massage, of silent hugs. So this goes back to hug for a minute because we want you to have that oxytocin in your body. But also, I cannot remember a night where I have sat down on the sofa with David to watch a show, right at the moment we're watching The Last Dance. If any of you are basketball fans, I highly recommend it. But we've sat down on the television to watch a television show. And at some point I put my feet into David's laps, lap and he will massage my feet for the next hour. I mean, it's astounding how long he will massage my feet. And that piece alone, it, it is just such a comforting, connecting thing. And so find what it is, whether you like head massages, whether you like back scratches, whether you like to walk holding hands, all of those tender things are going to help your body to produce oxytocin. So we also produce endorphins and endorphins are a natural way for us to block pain. And we are experiencing pain and suffering right now. There's no question that that is part of what life is doing. And the, the most effective way to, to produce endorphins is good hearty exercise. And that is one of the things that a lot of people have found to be more difficult to um, obtain right at the moment. You can't go to the gym. Going outside and exercising can be hard either because it's really hot out or it, it's too close or, or it's hard to exercise wearing a mask. All of those things are really disrupting our ability to produce um, those endorphins that help us to just block some of the pain that we don't need to be feeling, block some of the pain that can drag us down and keep us stuck. So just the idea of um, being able to um, reset the parasympathetic nervous system by doing something anaerobic does not mean that you have to actually go out and work out for a half an hour or 45 minutes or longer. You could just say, I'm going to reset my, my parasympathetic nervous system by for five minutes raising my heart rate. Whether you jog in place, whether you um, do jumping jacks, or whether you put some music on and have a five minute dance party with your partner or all the people in your family, just get your heart rate up for about five minutes, a couple of times a day, and that will help you to produce some of those endorphins that we need, that are helpful to be a part of what's going on in our um, whole nervous system. And the last one is serotonin, and serotonin is the mood booster that makes us sociable. <laughs> and so in this world of being socially distanced, it's like, what's the point? What are we doing here? Why do we need this? How do we do it? But we need it. We need it because it is the thing that allows us, um, in Imago, we were very clear to say that it's, it's physically distancing that we need to do, not socially distancing. And so we need to make sure that we are socially engaged with other people, that we're checking in on our friends, on our family, on our kids, on our community, that we, we have a way of knowing that that's going on. And the way to do that, so first of all, sun is one of the best ways for us to um, trigger serotonin. So if you're going to go for a walk in the sun, holding hands, you'll get a double one there because you get to get your, your um, serotonin along with your other hormones. But it also is something that, that we get from um, playing with a pet or playing with a child. The, the, the joy that we have that we experience in those situations produces serotonin or having a belly laugh. And so that's sort of my goal is to find something, something really outrageously funny that I can laugh about every day. That, that helps me to produce serotonin and that helps me to feel sociable. Oh yeah, I can walk back into this relationship with you because I, I'm feeling okay here. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> and I really appreciate your patience. Is there um, anything that I can help you with here? And thank you so much for listening.
Yes, your timing was perfect. Thank you so much, Haley. I didn't see any questions in the chat. Does anybody have anything uh, that they need clarified or, or I guess we'll be okay. I, what I'd like to put out there is that if there are any questions um, and you would like to have them forwarded, please do either put them in the chat or feel free to reach out to Rhonda directly, Rhonda Lehman, and she can make sure to get those questions over to Haley. Okay, so we have an opportunity. Haley, thank you so much. This was tremendously informative. I took notes copiously. <laughs> That's how I process. Um, and uh, and uh, I, uh, I will be thinking a lot about this as, uh, as we go through continued COVID and time together and uh, getting, you see you're getting some positive feedback there. Okay, um, as you may have also, go ahead. And could I say one thing? I, I do extend an open invitation to my couples group. It is free. I'm just doing it as a space for people to join. So if at some point you would like me to share that Zoom invitation with people or share it with you so that you can share it, I would be delighted to have anybody join us. Well, I, I would actually say, why don't you put that right into the chat box for anybody who's interested and they will have it right there for them. So thank you so much, Haley, again. All right, so with that, we are going to, uh, you may have noticed in the chat box also that we have a short Google form for anybody who can uh, access it right there. We would love your feedback on this part of the program. We are gonna continue to post it as we go through the program. Uh, for those of you who are staying, we'll continue on. Uh, for those of you who are leaving, thank you for having joined us so far. Okay, our next speaker is Stuart Rosenthal. So Stuart, a member of our community has been um, has been the is the founder. He and his wife Judy are the founder and publishers uh, and editor of the Beacon newspaper, which is a local paper for seniors in the Washington D.C. community, um, the greater Washington community. Um, and Stewart himself has been active not only in creating and and th this wonderful resource for seniors, but he's also been active on numerous boards and committees. Um, including the Montgomery County Commission on Aging and the Maryland State Commission on Aging, uh, which he chaired for quite some time. He's also served on the advisory committee for the DC Age Friendly Initiative and is currently actively involved with the Montgomery County and Howard County Age Friendly Initiatives, which are all affiliated with the WHO and the AARP. So today, uh, Stewart's gonna share survey data on both, lo uh, both local and national describing the effects of COVID on older adults. He's gonna to touch on a number of the issues that particularly concern this group and share information and local resources uh, that are able to help. So I just wanna make sure that Stuart has the ability to share his screen. So give me one second. Okay, good. We see you up on the screen now. Should be able to. Did you give it to him, Rabbi? Okay, be great. Able to. Great, thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate the introduction. Sure. I'm gonna start by thanking Rhonda for including the concerns of older adults in this important program and for inviting me to talk about them. When Rhonda was making up the flyer, she asked me if I used the title doctor. So let me state at the outset, I'm not a doctor or even a trained geriatric social worker. I sometimes play one at events like this, but my knowledge comes from more than 30 years experience working with and for older adults. So it's fairly broad, but not as deep as that of a professional in the aging field. I also want to begin by noting something that should be obvious, but bears repeating. When we speak about adults over 60, we're talking about a widely disparate group of people. In fact, more than one out of every five Americans. Even accounting for the many differences between individuals at any age, generally speaking, the needs and concerns of a person who's 60 will be different from those of someone who's 70, 80, 90, or centenarian. So today I'll be drawing generalizations and conflating a number of characteristics <clears throat> in order to speak generally about coping with COVID over 60. So I wanna ask, why do we start with the idea that COVID's a different matter for people over 60 than those who are younger? Well, for one thing, data from the CDC clearly show the number of Americans who have died from COVID are mostly older adults, and the older the age group, the higher the number. Let me share my screen here and show you, show you this. Uh, it says, host disabled participant screen sharing. So I need that to be re-enabled again, I think. That's exactly what I was wondering. Okay, let me. I'll, I'll change it, I'll change it, sorry. Got it. Okay. Go for it. Try it again, okay. There we go, all right. So these are statistics from the CDC. Uh, as you can see, the COVID deaths rise dramatically as the age group gets older. 
fit 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Here's the highest number. Uh, this is as of last Wednesday, by the way. But this column also shows here pneumonia deaths during the same period of time. And these are not related to COVID. These are simply people who have died of pneumonia. And as you can see, they're extraordinarily similar. And in fact, there are more pneumonia deaths than there are COVID deaths. So I just want to point that out, that this is an extraordinary time we're in. And of course, this is twice as many deaths as we usually would have this time of year, but it's not completely off the charts. While such brutal statistics may lead some older adults to barricade themselves in their homes, you may have seen the recent article in the Washington Post that interviewed a number of adult children of older adults, many of whom expressed alarm that their parents have a K sera sera attitude. They want to enjoy what time they have left, so they continue to gather and eat with their friends without masks or distancing, etc. So what I want to do in the next 20 minutes is first share some survey data to illustrate the broad range of responses people over 60 are reporting during the current pandemic. Then I want to talk about the many resources available in this area to help older adults with the issues they may be having. And finally, I'll touch on some elements of resilience that older adults and their family members can draw on to better manage this truly worldwide crisis. For a snapshot of local older adults, I'd like to share with you first some results from a reader survey the Beacon newspaper ran in our April issue. Now this isn't a statistically valid survey. It was simply completed by readers who chose to answer it. And it reflects their situation fairly early in the pandemic as all answers were submitted by late May. But we got more than 500 responses and the range of answers suggests we reached a broad cross section of the community. First, more than half the respondents said they live alone. Now that is somewhat unusual. The national average is about one in four older adults living alone. Also somewhat surprising was that nearly one in four said they knew someone who had contracted COVID-19. And remember, these responses came in during April and May. I have another slide here to show. Now, um, these are slides from our uh, results from some of our survey questions. I know they'll be hard to read. It's not really important that you be able to read the small text. It's really just to give you a break from staring at my Shane upon him while I'm talking. So one in five hadn't left their home for any reason in the prior week, and about half had left their house only once or twice. When they did interact with others, they were being careful. 95% told us they maintained social distance with others. We didn't ask about masks because the survey came out before masks were even recommended. By the way, I'm only going to show you a few slides as I, as I mentioned. Um, so don't worry about uh, whether they pertain exactly to the question I'm talking about at the, at the moment. Um, here's another slide. I was thrilled to see that about 350 of our respondents said they had begun to use what for them were new technologies as a result of the pandemic. Two thirds of them started using video chat such as Zoom. Nearly half began using social media, and one third tried out streaming, video, and telemedicine. Here we go, another, another um, set of behaviors that had changed as well. For example, two thirds had cut back on driving, half had canceled travel plans, a third had cut back on regular walks or exercising, which is a bit concerning, and about one out of five had started having prescriptions, groceries, and or meals delivered. One out of 10 had started to shop online for the first time. As for their feelings, a question that nearly every person answered, a surprising 42% said there was no change in how they were feeling. But about 30% said they felt more lonely and about the same number said they felt more depressed or anxious. Interestingly, about 4% of respondents said they actually felt less lonely, depressed or anxious as a result of the pandemic. We also invited respondents to write in additional feelings they were experiencing, and about 15% of them replied. Among the most frequently mentioned feelings were boredom, frustration, or annoyance, but there were others saying they felt content, calmer, grateful, and even hopeful. So we wondered if people were finding other silver linings from the pandemic, and we asked them, in what ways have you taken advantage of the slower pace of life to do more of the things you enjoy, or take care of things you need to do? Again, nearly everyone responded to this question. The most popular answers chosen by more than half of respondents were in order, more TV, watch TV and movies, read books and magazines, call old friends, file and store important papers, and clean out a room or attic. Slightly fewer said they were writing letters and emails, preparing and filing their tax returns, learning new things or taking online classes, with about 20% saying they were making art, playing a musical instrument, or writing poems and stories. 
So you might be thinking, these people sound like everyone else I know. How old are they anyway? Well, 22% were under 65, 34% were between 65 and 75, and 42% were 75 and up. You might be surprised by these findings. Are you wondering if they're an artifact of the Beacon's readership or skewed survey results, perhaps? Well, fortunately for me, a professionally conducted survey of people between 18 and 91 was published just this past Wednesday in the Journals of Gerontology. Based on a week-long diary collected from 776 U.S. and Canadian citizens who reported being affected by the pandemic, the researchers found that adults 60 and over experienced greater emotional well-being and felt less stressed or threatened by the pandemic than younger or middle-aged adults. Interestingly, the study reported no age differences in the frequency of COVID-19 related daily stressors or in the perceived severity of such stress. But Patrick Claber, the study's lead author from the University of British Columbia, pointed to what the researchers called non-COVID-19 stressors, which were still due to the pandemic, just not specifically disease related, to explain some of the differences between age groups. And I'll quote him, younger and middle-aged adults are faced with family and work-related challenges, such as working from home, homeschooling children, and unemployment, he said. They are also more likely to experience different types of ongoing non-pandemic stressors than older adults, such as interpersonal conflicts, something Haley and Assin suggested just a few minutes ago. He went on to say, while older adults are faced with more significant COVID-19 stressors, such as higher rates of disease, more severe complications, and higher mortality rates, they also possess more coping skills to deal with stress as they are older and wiser. Now that's something that the Beacon talks about a lot and that everybody agrees with, but I think it's a very important thing to, to admit and talk about. The study also revealed that compared to younger adults, older and middle-aged adults experienced more daily positive events, such as remote positive social interactions, which helped increase their positive emotions. Now, numerous studies conducted in more normal times have similarly found older adults to be generally happier and less stressed than younger generations. So in that sense, the study's results are not so surprising. But the researchers had wanted to know if COVID-19 had changed that attitude, especially given the disease's more severe effects among older adults. And the answer is apparently not. So why do so many of us have the sense that older adults in general are in a state of crisis today? The researchers had this to say, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to an outbreak of ageism in which public discourse has portrayed older adults as a homogeneous, vulnerable group our investigation of daily life and the outbreak suggests the opposite. But they did have a caveat at the end. Although our findings revealed that older adults on average were more psychologically resilient in the face of COVID-19, their physical health should continue to be a major public health priority. And now that makes it a good time for me to return to my first point. While the majority of older adults are handling this pandemic just fine, as I said before, there's a wide range of responses to COVID depending upon one's age and condition. And there are definitely a number of older adults who are extremely vulnerable during this pandemic. First, there are those living alone, especially those without family nearby. If they get ill, they may have no one to they feel comfortable turning to for help. And when they're afraid or anxious, they may lack some emotional support too. Second, the financial situation of many older adults is precarious. 21% of older couples and 45% of unmarried older Americans rely on social security for 90% or more of their income. And overall, nearly 10% of Americans 65 plus live in poverty, despite the social security benefits. That means some older adults face the decision of whether to buy food or medicine every month. And whichever they choose, their health will be adversely affected, which is probably why older adults who struggle with hunger are also more likely to have chronic health conditions like asthma, high blood pressure, and depression. Also, it's estimated that 5 to 8% of those over 60 suffer from a dementia. In the early stages, people are often unaware of this or in denial. For anyone living through these times with a developing dementia, especially if living alone or without family nearby, it must be especially frightening. On the other hand, many middle-aged and older Americans, including many of us right here on this Zoom probably, are hyper aware of the times we can't recall someone's name or where we left the keys which while perfectly normal behaviors, increase our anxiety even when there's no real evidence of dementia. Another point is that even older adults who are quite independent and fit have lost opportunities for exercise and socialization due to the closure of the rec centers, gyms, senior centers and libraries they're accustomed to participating with. 
With the pandemic stretching out over months and no clear end in sight, these people are likely to suffer reduced bone density and loss of muscle mass, both of which can adversely affect their daily functioning. Matters would only get worse over time if people don't make concerted efforts to resume exercise, and that's of course true for all of us. Another concern is that the fear of catching COVID has led many people with a variety of chronic conditions, or even urgent symptoms like chest pain, to avoid going to the hospital or calling EMS. And that leads to an increase in preventable illness and death from non-COVID causes. I pointed out earlier that many older adults in this area, including those who have long resisted adopting the latest technologies, have since the pandemic eagerly embraced, embraced new devices and apps. But there remains another group, generally the oldest old and lowest income, who are unwilling or unable to climb aboard that bandwagon. Many of these adults still use a landline phone as their primary means of communication. They don't have a computer, tablet, smartphone, or internet access. That puts them out of reach for telemedicine appointments and online therapy, as well as the many Zoom and web-based classes and socialization opportunities that can counteract loneliness, encourage exercise, and fight depression. I'll turn my uh, slides back on here for a second. These needs are affecting communities throughout the country. The National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, representing more than 600 federally and state funded agencies and nonprofits organized under the Older Americans Act, surveyed their directors re recently. And nearly every district reports facing highly increased demand for services, including a near doubling of demand for home delivered meals and telephone check ins, and significant increases in requests for caregiver supports, financial assistance, in home services, transportation, and more. Fortunately, our own area agency on aging in Montgomery County, known as Aging and Disability Services, offers a number of resources to help vulnerable older adults in our community. I'll just touch briefly on a few of them. To address the need for healthy food, Montgomery County, utilizing the help of recreation department staff, nonprofits like the Jewish Council for the Aging, and the new teen summer program for employment called COVID Corps, I'll show you a little slide here of them, um, is delivering a week's worth of healthy frozen meals, unfortunately not kosher ones, to hundreds of seniors who are unable to get out to shop or prepare food for themselves. Of course, there is also Central Maryland Meals on Wheels, which utilizes individual volunteers to deliver meals daily to older adults in need. And there's a Kosher Meals on Wheels program operated by Jessa. Another slide here. In addition, this is new, through the end of August, JCA is operating a county-funded mitzvah meals program, offering two free Shabbat meals prepared by Shalom Zermatis and delivered by Beaker Kolum volunteers to any county resident 60 plus. There's no low income requirement, no kosher requirement, but funds are limited, so it's first come, first serve. Those who can get out to shop but can't afford to buy food may also contact Yad Yehuda for help from their Capital Kosher Pantry and Tom Chay Shabbat programs right here in Kent Mill. And we also, as you may have noticed, have another active food pantry in the neighborhood. Located at the Christian Reformed Church on Arcola, it's not kosher, of course, but it's for those of any age with food insecurity. It's run by Pastor Doug Bratt, who began his non-denominational free pantry several months ago, and he's found demand has doubled week after week. Currently, more than 500 families come from all over the county for free boxes of food every Tuesday, landing up on Arcola Avenue. Of course, all of these groups are in greater need than ever for donations of food and money in order to meet today's increased demand. So if you're in a position to help, I'm sure all of these groups would be grateful. As for exercise opportunities, the Montgomery County Recreation Department lists a number of virtual classes on their new Rec Room page on their website. For older adults, there are, for example, yoga and Zumba classes. Also, starting in August, coming up actually next week, the department expects to have small group in-person classes outdoors for Tai Chi and other such events. Details should be out shortly. To date, Montgomery County has not succeeded in obtaining federal grants to obtain tablets and smartphones for older adults like some other areas have. But for those who already own these devices, the COVID Corps I mentioned before is offering one-on-one -on -one tutoring in how to use smartphones and computers. Such hands-on general intergenerational I can't really say this word, intergenerational education has long been a regular feature of tech cafes that bring together Montgomery County high school students and older adults who need to learn how to make use of technology. Of course, these cafes, which have taken place regularly at local synagogues, have been temporarily suspended due to the pandemic. 
You may also have heard of a new organization in the neighborhood, Camp Mill Village. This is a volunteer run nonprofit that aims to make it easier for older adults to age in place. That is to remain in their homes as they age with the help of neighborhood volunteers. Among the services the village is able to offer during the pandemic are grocery and prescription delivery, regular check-in calls, and Zoom gatherings with interesting speakers. Prior to COVID and resuming, hopefully in a post-pandemic future, the village will offer members transportation to all types of appointments, social engagements, and concerts. Anyone interested in volunteering for the village is welcome to contact me afterwards. I'm the treasurer and would be happy to chat. And of course, people are also invited to become members of the village. For more information about the wide variety of older services and of services available to older adults in the county, pick up a copy of the Montgomery County Seniors Resource Guide. This is a free annual publication of the Beacon, and copies are available in the Beacon Rack at the entryway of the Kent Mill CVS. It can also be viewed online at our website, thebeaconnewspapers.com. The guide is basically a phone directory of county government, nonprofit, and business services that focus on the needs of older adults in the area. I'm sure many other speakers in this series will be suggesting strategies to maintain and increase one's resilience in difficult times like these. I'll just briefly mention a few common sense ones that can be helpful for all of us. First, if you're the adult child of an older adult or a caregiver, you need to make sure to take care of yourself first. If you're not well or let your physical or mental health decline, you won't be much help to your loved one. It's just like the oxygen masks in the airplane, put it on yourself and then help your child. Each of the following strategies for self-care, which come from the Mayo Clinic website, also apply to the older adults in our lives. But it's important that we model these behaviors ourselves for them, as well as for our own children. These behaviors include get enough sleep, engage in regular exercise or take walks, eat healthy, avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, limit screen time, and that especially includes limiting time watching the news or reading the daily paper about COVID, and take time for yourself to relax and recharge. To reduce stress, try to stick with a regular routine even while sheltering at home. Continue to eat regular meals and to bathe, the nine days being an exception. Get dressed for work if working at home and exercise. Try to focus on positive thoughts, starting and ending each day with a list of things you are thankful for, something we can all do when we dive in with Kavanaugh. Call on your spiritual life and daily prayers for comfort and support and set priorities. It's easy to become overwhelmed, so focus on reasonable goals for each day. And of course, connect with others. Reach out to friends, neighbors, and fellow congregants if you have a need, or if you can help others. It can be difficult to make time for these simple strategies in the midst of a stressful pandemic, but self-care is an essential need, not an extravagance. To summarize, I hope the perspective that comes with age will help our older neighbors endure this difficult period with grace, dignity, and in good health, despite the numerous challenges we all face. I also hope what I've shared today will help all of us better keep the needs of our elders in mind as we navigate our own families through this lengthy pandemic. As we all know and have heard so many times, we're all in this together. So let's try to be there for each other. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to attempt to answer any questions you might have. That was fabulous, Stuart. Thank you so much. It was informative, not only how, in terms of how we can volunteer, how we can help to support the elderly in our community or even beyond our community. Although the resources are local, the perspective that we hold and how we help and reach out to elderly people or older people around in any of our spaces around the country or around the world, I think this is, it's a wake up call to all of us. One question that I did have, just briefly, since you were so good about time and you actually have two more minutes, uh, one question that I had was, did they, in any of the survey responses, have wisdom that they, that they shared, meaning how, what, what their perspective is and how they get through this with resilience? All over the place. Yes, we had a lot of comments from people that went on at some pages and pages of them. Um, but, you know, it's, they're all talking about their own personal experience. So, as I say, it depends on the individual. But there are people who said that they found, they found strength in their faith. There were people who said they found strength by volunteering to help others. Uh, and then there were people who were really at wit's end and had, you know, very, very shocking things to say about how they felt completely abandoned and left out and, and uh, at a loss. Um, and this was like the first opportunity they had had to like express themselves. So people don't always know where to turn, how, where to go when they need to, uh, to get help. So it's a shame, but that's why I'm telling everyone here, please spread the word. Uh, people need, when people need help, they need to have someone they can talk to. 
So Stuart, there's also a question that just came in. Can you please share information on the Zoom events that Kent Mill Village has been holding? All we've heard about are, call, are calls to seniors. Well, we had um, from Kiplinger's, we had a uh, very expert speaker on what to do with your, what your needs are now financially and in terms of your paperwork when you're facing the kind of situation we're facing. We're all sort of thinking about mortality. You know, what do we need to do and how do we need to do it? So she went on and covered the gamut of, conversa of things that we need to do in terms of preparing our wills and thinking about uh, needs of that sort and, and, and talking to our lawyers and talking to our families. Uh, it was a very interesting program and it's been recorded. So I believe, uh, I think it's even available on our website. I'm not sure of that. Uh, I will I'll look into that or you can, you can check it yourself. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much again for that. Everyone, as you noticed, uh, there is that uh, Google form. If you're able to fill it out, that would be very helpful. I see someone asked for a list of the resources I mentioned. I'll be happy to post those uh, before this event is over today. Yeah, and please post it right into the chat. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Stuart. This was really, really informative and loved your background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Sharon Frendel. Um, okay, let's see, Sharon Frindell. I'm trying to make sure that you have co-hosting abilities, Sharon, so that you can share your screen. Um, Thank you. No problem. Uh, it looks like, Rabbi, we might need to either take somebody can, off of the co-hosting. I, I can do it. But you got it? Okay, because I was going to say, this. I think we have too many here. <laughs> too many co-hosts, perhaps, or something. Okay, Sharon is the Managing Director of the JEIC, the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge. She was the, before, it, before that iteration, she has a long history in Jewish education and in Jewish educational leadership. Um, she was the department chair for Tanakh and Torah Shabal Peh, um, and the Mashkicha Ruchanit, the spiritual guidance counselor. Um, for the Birdman Hebrew Academy Upper School. Uh, she was director, most recently before this position, she was the director of Jewish life at the Milton Gottesman Jewish Day School. And now she has um, the most excellent job of being able to coordinate um, innovative educational opportunities with tremendous educators from around the world. Um, today, she is going to be uh, looking at two characters and their responses to trauma. Um, Job, Eov, and Yona. And I don't want to give too much because she's going to give more of it herself right now. But with that, Sharon, um, let's make sure that you are also pinned. Ta -da! There you are. And take it away. Terrific. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you, Rhonda and Tamara, for this opportunity to share a few words of Torah with the community. Um, many of you have read an article that I wrote in Jewish Education Leadership on drawing on biblical models to help us figure out how to build our own resilience, a, score, a skill that is sorely needed in these trying times. Uh, when this year is over, I will uh, post in the chat a link to that article if you're interested in reading it. Now, in that article, I focused on the self-destructive responses of Noah and Lot in response to trauma, as contrasted with Avram Avinu, who worked through his response to trauma to power on in his life. And today, I'd like to explore with you two other characters who have what to teach us about responses to trauma. Job, Eov, who displayed remarkable resilience, and Jonah, Yona, whose rigidity caused him pain and suffering. We're not going to be looking at the theological ramifications of each story, but we're going to be homing in on the personalities of the title characters, specifically in their response to life difficulties and trauma, so that we can perhaps draw some lessons and chizuk from them, from the two of them contrasted with each other, and from God's response to each of them. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen only with the specific psukim, the specific verses that I'm citing, so that you can both hear them and see them. And otherwise, we can see many more people on screen if I don't share my screen the whole time. So let's review the stories in a Reader's Digest condensed version. And then we will look at God's statements to each of these men. Most of us know in painful detail the story of Yonah from reading it and hearing it every Yom Kippur afternoon. Therefore, 
you know that he is the antithesis of a resilient person. When God tasks him with something he does not want to do, he flees by boat. And when the boat gets into literal choppy waters, he descends below and goes to sleep. Both avoidance strategies, not particularly constructive. Then, when the sailors are forced to throw him overboard and he's swallowed by a fish, he doesn't try to pull a MacGyver, but he seems to be at sea in terms of developing a plan for getting out. See what I did there? He's at sea in terms of developing a plan. But at least he does pray. Once back on dry land, he fulfills God's imperative by giving the tersest nivuah in the entire Tanakh. Five words. Od arba'im yom v'ninve nehepachet. In another 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, it is incredibly ironic that the king takes these words to heart and saves the city of Nineveh because this is the only destruction of Ua in the entire Nach in which the people actually listen to the prophet and repent and return from their evil ways. Now, Jonah's thrown by this unexpected response and goes off to have a temper tantrum under the shade of a kikayon growth, some sort of gourd. I would say this is hardly resilient. We will come back to visit the end of the story after we see Job and his response to trauma. We'll go a bit more deeply into the story of Eov, both because as opposed to the four chapter Sefer Yonah, Sefer Eov goes on for more than 40 chapters. And because I believe that more people are familiar with the story of Yonah than with the story of Eov. Eov is a successful cattle farmer with a wife and children. As a result of a conversation with the Satan, who I feel compelled to remind you is a servant of God and not an anti-God character, if you will. God kills Eov's animals and all of his children, in addition to afflicting him with painful physical ailments. In a move worthy of being called resilient, Eov rejects his wife's advice to curse God and just give up and die. He will not do that, but he continues to bless God while acknowledging that he has no idea why this is happening to him. Into his suffering come his three friends. Notice the air quotes I'm making. Bildad, Eliphaz, and Sofar, who all offer helpful, more air quotes, suggestions. Each in his own way suggests that Eov must have sinned or else why would God bring all of these calamities upon him? This, by the way, is where lies the crux of the theological and moral underpinnings of the book, which is not the subject of our discussion today. We can learn a great deal from the three friends on what not to say to someone who is suffering and what will not help anyone build up further resilience when necessary. By the way, we have all either experienced such counter helpful support or have at least witnessed it. Hopefully none of us has perpetrated it. You know, like when someone says, God doesn't give anyone more than they can handle when a person feels really ready to collapse, or at least your loved one didn't suffer so much. Now in the case of my loved one, if you don't get quite what I'm saying, Let's watch together this short video by Brene Brown on empathy. And after the session, I will put the URL in the chat.
So that is just a um, that is just a a, a sort of uh, introduction into empathy and what Job's friends were not doing. Now, there's one more note about empathy. Whereas uh, Brene Brown points out any statement that starts with at least is not empathetic, if we say it to ourselves, it builds our own gratitude, which I believe is key for resilience. For instance, I cannot hug my adult children, but at least we have the technology in which I can see them. Or I cannot attend shul, but at least I get to hear the rabbi's drasha every week. This can help us in ways that if someone else says the same thing, it'll hurt a great deal. Gratitude and therefore resilience can be surfaced and strengthened also by making brachot. If when I get up in the morning, I realize that I can see and I say, Baruch pokeach ivrim, or that I have clothes to wear, and I say, Baruch malbisha rumim, that reminds me that I'm not so bad off. And when I really first wake up and say, Moda ani, I thank you, shehechazarta bi nishmati la, that you returned my soul to me with grace, Rabba emunatecha, and you, God, believe in me a lot. I can face my day with strength and courage. But let's go back to Eov. After his, let's call them visitors, continue talking, by chapter 13, he calls them quacks, as in fake doctor. And in a very nice way, he tells them to shut up. This already reveals his strength of character, as he still has the wherewithal to tell them to cut out the nonsense as it is not helping him. Enter Elihu, the Gen Z to Eov's boomer status, who claims that God communicates with humans through either dreams or suffering. He says that physical suffering provides the sufferer with an opportunity to realize God's love and forgiveness when he is well again, understanding that God has ransomed him from an impending death. This is at least a better response to Eov's suffering than the first three offered. Then God enters the scene, and in a moving soliloquy, offers Job the ultimate comfort, and this begins in chapter 38. Then God replied to Eov out of a whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel speaking without knowledge? Gird your loins like a man. I will ask you and you will inform me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Speak if you have understanding. Do you know who fixed its dimensions or measured it with a line? Onto what were its bases sunk? Who set its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the divine beings shouted for joy? Who closed the sea behind doors when it gushed forth out of the womb? When I clothed it in clouds, swaddled it in dense clouds, when I made breakers my limit for it and set up bars and doors and said, you may come so far and no farther. Here, your surging waves will stop. Have you ever commanded the day to break, assigned the dawn to its place so that it seizes the corners of the earth and shakes the wicked out of it? It changes like clay under the seal until its hues are fixed like those of a garment. Their light is withheld from the wicked and the upraised arm is broken. Have you penetrated to the sources of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been disclosed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you surveyed the expanses of the earth? If you know of these, tell me. Which path leads to where the light dwells? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its domain and know the way to its home? God keeps going on like this for a few more chapters. And clearly, these are rhetorical questions without answer. And Job is at first rendered silent, 
And then he acknowledges God's unlimited power and admits the limitations of his human knowledge. The story ends with God restoring and adding on to everything Eov had had prior to this episode. And the last two verses of the book read, afterwards, Eov lived 140 years to see four generations of children and grandchildren. So Eov died old and contented. Eov is the model of resilience. He refuses to lie down and die, even in the light of the most horrible tragedies happening to him. He stands up against his friends who claim that he alone is responsible for his misfortunes. And he stays true to God, who finally helps him understand that some things are beyond human ken, giving meaning to suffering for those of true faith. Let's go back now to Yonah. Just as God comes to Eov to ask rhetorical questions, he does the same thing at the end of the book of Yonah. Once Yonah has taken refuge under the Kikayon growth, God dries it up, causes it to wither, and blows it away. Now, you would think that somebody who's been in the belly of a fish for three days would say of this, no big deal. But Yonah displays no resilience whatsoever to the point that he wants to die. And God responds with this rhetorical question. Bayomer Hashem. Ato chasta ala kikayon asher loa maltabo vlogi dalto shebin laila haya uvin laila avad vaani loa chus al ninve ha ir hagdola asher yesh bahar be mishtenis re ribo adom asher loya da be miminolis molo uvehema raba. Then God said, You cared about the plant which you did not work for and which you did not grow which appeared overnight and perished overnight. And I should not care about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and many animals. However, here, as contrasted with Job, Jonah offers no response and God offers no restitution. There is no closure to this book, and we're left with the question dangling in the air. Eov, who displayed resilience and faced his trials and tribulations head on, was rewarded by God. Jonah, Job's diametric opposite, whose misfortunes were not nearly the extent of Eov's, and who brought all of his misfortunes upon his own head, is left to contemplate God's question. So here are the questions I will leave with you today. Who are we? In this coming year, will we receive explanations from God that there is a divine master plan and he knows what he is doing even if we do not? Or will we remain with only an unanswered question left hanging in the air? Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, those perspectives from a spiritual, pers those spiritual perspectives can be really helpful to us in these moments, because I would venture to say that each of us have both our Eov moments and our Yona moments, uh, and that we may travel through them um, back and forth over this course of time. And hopefully we all are uh, left to embrace the Eov model to the extent that we can. Does, if anyone has any questions, this would be a good time. We have a little bit of extra time in here. And I also wanted to just make one administrative note, and that is um, I plan to leave the uh, room open for a few minutes afterwards for anybody who wants to look at the, Sharon, I think you said you were going to also post the URL. <clears throat> So if anybody wants to copy any of the information that has been placed in the chat, but has been very absorbed in listening to the speakers as they should have been, um, we'll leave the room open for just a couple minutes at the end so that you can go back and you can copy all of those links. Okay. Anybody, anybody 
any other thoughts or questions they would like to add? If not, then we will go on to Dr. Alana Fine. Okay, so um, Dr. Fine, our friend uh, Alana, you're here. Um, Rabbi, can you please give her sharing, thank you, sharing privileges. Um, Alana is a clinical psychologist, as I said, in private practice in Rockville. She is a specialist in health psychology. Um, she works with pac patients individually and in groups to promote and maintain good physical and mental health. Hi, so hi. today, Alana is going to speak about weight gain during the pandemic, COVID-19 emotional eating, which we have all experienced, I'm sure, um, and coping with stress. So with that, um, Alana, let's get you pinned. There you are. Perfect. Uh, you need your mute button off and then you're good. Good. I just need to share my screen. I have my tech team. Great. You okay. see how to do it? Perfect. We're good. Okay, great. Thank you. Take it away when you're ready. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, before I begin, um, I would like to thank Laura Goldman for moderating today, and also a big thank you to Rhonda and Tamara Wiseman for organizing today's program. Our community is very lucky to have both professionals and volunteers who are always working behind the scenes to, have, to just enhance every moment of life, and certainly this pandemic is an example of that. Before I start talking about weight and size, I just want to make sure that my comments are not, everyone, no one feels directed that I'm making a comment how anybody should look or what you should eat, eat or to fat shame anybody. I'm a believer in the health at every size model and that our goal is just to teach people to embrace their health wherever they are in their lives. So emotional eating and coping skills during stressful times dealing with the COVID-15. So hold on one second. Sorry, my mouse isn't working. Okay, so we've seen those pictures on Facebook in different places. Banana bread is enjoying a resurgence. We've seen beautiful pictures posted of people sourdough bread. We've seen that there's been a yeast shortage going around. So what is going on? Is there such a thing as the COVID-15? Are people gaining weight similar to when kids go up to school and gain the freshman 15? So uh, WebMD did actually did a study in the spring, and yes, it's true. 47% of women and 22% of men have reported gaining weight. And specifically, the American Heart Association and Mayo Clinic have broken down how much weight they've gained between one and two, three pounds, and even up to 20 pounds. People worry about these kinds of very quick weight loss because it's the kind of quick weight loss that we often see on holidays where people pick a couple of pounds here and there, and then they often hold on to them for their lives. Now, we know that in Europe, they started the epidemic pandemic earlier, so their studies have started to come out. And there was a very interesting Italian study that came out. And again, it, it was very similar to the American study that 48% of people have gained weight. But if you also look, you could see that 14% of people lost weight, that this is very similar and different for different people, that, um, that there are people using this as a health opportunity and for other people who are seen to be just succumbing to weight gain. Looking at the Italian study, there were other interesting things. 3% of smokers quit smoking. Quitting smoking is really hard, and this is a really impressive number, but people are really fearful of the respiratory effects of COVID. 40% of people increased physical activity, and what's interesting is most of the people have not started studying, started exercising, who didn't start, who didn't exercise before, but it's people who have been sort of wishy-washy about exercising have really increased the amount of time they've exercised. There's a little bit of focus on health. There's an increase of people focus on the Mediterranean diet. It's Italy, that's a little bit expected, um, and people eating organic food. But yes, more people are eating bread, pizza, and dessert. So what, how is it that people are losing weight? Because people often want to be part of that group, not the weight gain group. Um, there's less eating out. Uh, one of my patients, really for a few months, we worked on how to let her to not stop at Chipotle on her way home from work. And she said, it's the best thing. I don't go to work. I don't go to Chipotle anymore. People are using their time commuting to cook healthier foods and exercise. There are less social occasions. Gone are our big Shabbos meals. We're not at Simcha's where there are opportunities to overeat. 
people are more careful about making food last. I have a patient who said that in the olden days, you know, she would have had dinner, left her extra rolls out, and then afterwards, when she, um, when she, like at 10 o'clock, she probably would have eaten all the rolls sitting on the counter. But instead, she's worried about her food lasting, so she puts them in the freezer, and it means she's not really overeating at night. There's a risk of COVID and obesity. We know that there's inflammation and that there's a relationship between obesity, and some people are sort of taking that as a charge to go into lose weight. And also, the last thing is using this as an opportunity to grow and change. There are people who are looking at this time and trying to create a narrative, like this is what's going on, and I'm going to do something about it. For example, there's, a, there's somebody I know who works at Berman who decided in the first week of the pandemic that she was gonna start jogging every day. And basically in the last five months, she's lost 14 pounds because the jogging started her healthy eating and thus using her time that she was commuting to really take care of herself. And she said, I know people are suffering, they're losing jobs, but this has been the best thing to happen to me in a really long time. Um, now, reasons for weight gain, which more people probably relate to, no longer going to gym, the gym. And this is important because polls show that 25% of people do not plan on returning to the gym. It's just something not on their agenda, which is important for people to really think about, about ways to start exercising at home and in their lives. The last few weeks have been trying because it's been so hot and it's amazing if you go to Brookside Gardens in the morning, how hopping it is, people trying to get early walks out. But I really encourage people to find exercise that they like. There were very few people who wake up and say, boy, I can't wait till I exercise. I just love exercising. They are there, but they're very few. But exercise is different because people really have to go exercise. And then once they're there, their endorphins start kicking in and they start getting the rewards of exercising. Um, staying at home and online working, people aren't walking up and down the steps of the metro. They're not walking through their office. Their bathroom breaks are right. And there's just a limited amount of movement stockpiling groceries. You know, we have a lot of children, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, and there's like that little extra urgency that came to stockpiling of groceries that we could see within those groups. But food that is pantry stable is often less healthy than healthy food. And so it's important to balance the two. Um, people are bored and boredom could sometimes lead to cooking or just extra eating. And studies show that boredom is associated with greater energy intake. There's stress eating, you know, the word comfort food just says it all. And it, it feels good to people to eat those food. It leads to extra serotonin production in your brain. Um, people are choosing to fall off their diets. It's this idea of like not being so disciplined anymore and that you, you're choosing to go on it, to go off of it. And alcohol, about 20% of people really record increased alcohol use, which is just an increased calorie right from there. Um, oops, the wrong way. So just a quick 101 about weight loss, just a review for everyone. So how does a person lose weight? I know it's pretty obvious, but you need to burn more calories than you take in. So it's on the one hand, people need to really burn more calories. And on the other hand, if you're eating more calories, you're going to gain more weight. So what do we see? Um, so just a quick reminder, in case anyone else doesn't know this, or just a refresher. So it takes 3,500 calories or units of energy in order to add or to lose a pound. So if you cut back 250 calories a day, you lose a half a pound a week. And similarly, if you eat that extra snack, it's an extra half a pound a week. Um, and you can read the rest of the chart, 500 calories is a pound a week. I used to do a lot of work for the Mayo Clinic um, before I, I moved to Maryland. And there was a doctor there who was always like, you know, cut out one thing a day, a half a pound a week. And everyone used to come to me and say, you know, I don't come to you to lose a half a pound a week. I'm looking for a pound, I'm looking for two pounds, even three pounds. But a half a pound a week, a slight little health change is 25 pounds a year. And, and 25 pounds is something that you could really see, you could really feel and really have the health benefits on. And, it's an example that small change has a very, very large impact. So what are our goals for people's eating? We want people to eat like babies, right? It's the principles of attuned, healthy, mindful eating. So ask yourself, am I hungry? Do you eat when you are hungry? So you ask yourself, what are you hungry for? And do you stop when you were full and satisfied or do you just keep going and going and going? 
Now, again, when I show this picture, sometimes people are like, yeah, but they're really pudgy babies. Um, but the goal is for people to just like really have a good relationship with food. You're hungry, you enjoy your food, you eat, you enjoy your food, and then you're full and satisfied. But what we often see, especially now, is emotional hunger. And I'd like for a few minutes to just point out some of the differences between physical hunger and emotional hunger. And it'll be interesting because Tisha B'Av is coming up this week. And so Tisha B'Av is like a great opportunity for people to pay attention to their physical hunger and their physical hunger pain, you know, as the day goes on. So physical hunger, people often feel in their stomach or belly. Like you're, you might be hungry or you might just be like, hmm, I'm thinking about food but because my body is looking for food. Where with emotional hunger, people often think, oh my gosh, I want to get that food in my mouth. I want to eat that and just get that in my mouth. And often I ask people, what their favorite part of eating is. And they talk about putting food in their mouth and swallowing it, not necessarily, you know, getting full. Physical hunger is predictable. It's gradual. Like we were saying with babies, you feed them and then they're usually good for a few hours. And it lasts for three to five hours after the last meal. Where emotional hunger is often very urgent, like, oh my gosh, I need to eat this. The other interesting thing about Emotional hunger is usually people really focus on a certain item. Oh my gosh, I'm so in the mood for a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup or that challah looks so delicious. Where with physical hunger, people are open to diverse foods versus having a very specific craving. It's slow and mindful physical hunger versus like this rapid out of control. And people with emotional hunger, it's like a, usually a very sad experience because very often they eat their food and then they don't realize they've eaten it because it's such a fast experience. And then they get so sad to look at their plate and all their food is gone. Um, people with physical hunger are often eating with others. And one of the things that makes this whole COVID thing so hard is because emotional eating is often done alone and we have more opportunities now to eat alone um, and to go and for that to be an issue. So what makes food so hard? What makes this whole eating thing so hard? You know, it's something that should be natural. It's something that should just bring us joy. So I'd like to ask everyone just to think about it. How many food decisions do you make per day? And you could throw it out into the chat. On a typical day, how many food decisions does a person make? Do you think you make? I can't see the chat. Okay, oh, my son just showed it to me. Five, six, four, 55, 25. Okay. So, okay, interesting. So there's a fellow who used to be at the Cornell Food Lab. His name is Brian Wansink, and it's different. People make 200 on average, 21 food decisions per day. Right, Sharon's shaking her head because it's an overwhelming number of food decisions. So first of all, you could make a really good healthy decision, the first like 184, but it's the 185 and the 186 at night that usually gets the people. Um, and these are just different decisions. Should I have coffee now? Should I have sugar in my coffee? Am I mood for this snack? Am I mood for eat the whole thing? How much, you know, you know, do I want ice cream now or whatever, you know, or to skip it up. But what's hard about also the pandemic is our homes have become vending machines, if you see the picture. Like we're constantly surrounded by our pantry and food. We're at work, you know, like you're not really going to eat in front of everybody all day, but you sort of could go on Zoom, put on, turn off your video and have a little snack when nobody's looking. It's a constant presence for us in general. Also, you know, our bodies are made to hold on for food. Just from an evolutionary perspective, food has been a scarce resource. For Pesach, I bought my family a nutcracker and nuts. And like, it was a very surreal experience for everybody. How hard you have to work to open a walnut or to open a hazelnut with a nutcracker. Because the food used to be much more work and to come. Whereas for us, we go to Trader Joe's, you buy a bag of nuts and you just consume it so quickly. And so it's just the plentitude and the frequency. And, the, and again, now we'll talk a little bit about the type of foods we eat. The foods that a lot of us buy, especially now with the pandemic, where people are looking for pantry stable food or freezer friendly food, are food engineered by scientists with the goal of having us consume consumers buy as much as possible. We talk, we hear a lot this about children because when children are targeted, especially for cereal, they become consumers for life. That people often stick to the same cereal for their entire life. But you could see this, and I love this example: the anatomy of a chicken nugget. 
chicken nuggets are designed for people to start them down. They're bite-sized, they're small, people just throw them in the their mouth. Their food, it's smooth, it's processed, and just eat quickly. It's whitish meat. Chicken nuggets are really dark meat, mixed with white meat with whey protein to make you feel like they're good, old, healthy white meat, but it's just more than that. It has a very serious crunch factor. People spend time um, figuring that out. It's fried. People love fried food, French fries, French toast. We can name them all. And the sweet sauce. David Kessler, the former head of the FDI, spent a lot of time talking to people about the role of having fat, sugar, and salt. And when you have those three foods together, the, the three combination just lights up people's brains like that they see in MRIs as just the most incredibly satisfying and addicting food. So when we add something like ketchup to the sugar and fat of a chicken nugget, the combination is why kids ask for them all the time and they're hard to resist. So it's important to think about the foods you eat. If you eat an apple, there's something very satisfying in the amount of time and the amount of crunch for a carrot that goes into it versus let's say having applesauce. Exercise. Another challenge that people have with exercise is the idea that I call the exercise fallacy. So when I used to live in New York City, you, I would see people go to the gym, and then very often outside of the gym, there are those coffee carts where people would grab their coffee and grab a muffin on their way out. And I think people often expect to lose more weight exercising. They do because they often think that because they exercise, they could eat whatever they want. But there's this, the benefits of exercise are enormous. And if you catch Adia Harmati's talk, he speaks about this from the other day, which was excellent, and I highly recommend it, um, about the health benefits of exercise. And there are a lot of reasons to exercise in terms of the mood, in terms of the effect on your body, developing muscle mass. But you can't exercise and then eat more and then expect to lose weight because it's, it's like spending money. It takes a long time to make money and you could go to the supermarket or Costco and spend it in 15 minutes. It's the same thing for exercise. It takes a lot more time to burn calories than to eat calories. So if you go to the gym and you jog at eight kilometers an hour, which is a good workout um, for 33 minutes, that just covers the muffin you're eating to reward yourself. There's not a benefit after that. Okay, another thing that gets into the people's way of uh, when they're trying to lose weight is the dieter's dilemma. That it's very common if someone has a desire to lose weight, they start dieting and restricting, and they're really not eating enough. That's why when you're watching what you eat, it's just important to have a well-rounded meal, have breakfast, because then what happens is people start having cravings and they lose control and they overeat, and then they regain their lost weight, and then the cycle just continues and continues. So it's really important to make sure that it, it, like if you're trying to lose weight, you still have to just stay very well nourished and very well fed and take good care of yourself. Another thing that we see, there's a lot of doom scrolling going on where people are spending endless amount of time online, reading about all the things and how the world's falling apart. And yes, there really are a lot of terrible things going on, but health experts are saying that it's really important for people to contain that habit. People recommend a half an hour a day for the news, an hour, and on our phones, that they just go with us everywhere. It's just so easy to keep going and going and catching news. And again, there's a balance between being very well informed versus just really spending our time submerged in the news. So this is a very challenging thing. And if you can't be strong, be smart. It's important for people to set themselves up in a way that's good. For example, if you tell yourself, don't eat that chocolate cake and keep sending messages of being, you know, there's nothing that has wants people to have chocolate cake any less than if you say don't eat that chocolate cake. And just to really balance the message that we're sending to us to try to maintain our stress levels and just have a really good, healthy perspective. People often test their willpower, but willpower only really takes people so far. And it's just important to set up your environment in a way to help yourself. So one of the ways of doing this is a woman who I, I really like following. Her name is Gretchen Rubin, um, and she wrote a book a few years ago called The Four Tendencies. So let's say you're somebody who wants to start a new habit, like exercising or watching what you're eating or just watching the less news. It's important to think about what motivates you in your behavior, and she breaks it down to four different kinds of people. The first group is an upholder. 
people, there are those group of people, there are not so many of them, but they're there. Some of them might be on this call. Um, upholders who do what others expect and what I expect for myself. Those are people you just have to clear your calendar, make some time to exercise, and you could do it. Now, for a lot of us, there are some things where we're upholders, and then there are other things that we're not. This is not consistent to all behaviors, though generally it, these are personality traits. The second group of people are questioners. Those are people who I do what I think is best according to my judges, but if it doesn't make sense, I won't do it. And those are people who really benefit from research and listening to experts, to finding people and to learning what, what, what is research telling us, what's out there. And they're people like until they're convinced, won't do it. So it's really just a matter of figuring out what information supports you. The majority of people are obligers who do what they have to do because they don't want to let others down, but have no problem letting themselves down. So for example, they're the group of people who really do well finding an exercise buddy to exercise with, or doing Weight Watchers, or finding an accountability group. When the pandemic started, I was really lucky because I was part of a step group, and every day we had to report our steps. And you know, the weather was not always so good, or it was just very easy to get lost in the day. But I knew because I had to report my steps, it really got me into shape in terms of just getting out and exercising, which has a ton of health benefits. One thing about obligers also, which is important to note, is that people do not do well being accountable to their spouses, that it does not create a healthy dynamic. So people are like, well, I told my, you know, significant other, I told my, even like a child or a parent, you know, someone you speak to regularly, you really have to tell someone who you're really more embarrassed about not following through. And the last person is a rebel. Those are people who just want to do it their own way. You can't convince them about anything. Um, it's funny because we used to not see so many rebels, but I think now with like the mass movement, we sort of are seeing more rebels, like don't tell me what to do. I just want to do what I really, really want to do. And I almost can't argue with those people and they need to find their own path. Um, so what are some steps to overcoming emotional eating? Become aware of your triggers. People each have their own triggers and it's our opportunity to look at ourselves and grow from ourselves. Do a hunger reality check. Do an emotional reality check. Why am I eating? Am I stressed out? Am I this? You know, there's also room, I'm hungry, I'm really in the mood for this piece of pizza and you should go eat it and enjoy it. Stop smart, meal plan, focus on healthy meals and what is your eating schedule? One thing that's been a little bit interesting is that people are waking up later and also people in the same families are on very different schedules. So teenagers are on very different schedules than the rest of their families, even though they're all on the same schedule up till four o'clock in the morning. So, so what happens I see in my house is like, I'm ready for bed and someone is like starting to make their own dinner because they're eating dinner at 10 o'clock. And, and just to make sure like, are you eating a fourth meal, a fifth meal? Alana Milstein from the 2B Mindset always says dinner and done, you know, like don't keep eating and eating and eating. Find other ways to manage stress and negative emotions. And again, um, a Harmonti talk really gets into this. Keep some patients out of your house, adjust your setup. It's probably not so good if you're always eating it, working in your kitchen to try to find a good workspace. But plenty of sleep and exercise, getting outside is the best thing to do for yourself and get support when needed. Like there's a lot of talk of having a good mindset and all this stuff, but also if you're really experiencing depression, isolation, harder feelings, you can't do it alone. And then there's, there's a new helpline, I just read about it in the paper this week, um, between the Jewish Federation and JESA, which I put the number 703J Caring, which is a place people could call for help besides resources in the school and our community um, and the people who you find helpful. Sharon Frenzel, we all love Brene Brown. Perhaps people here are part of the 14 million people who've already watched her TED Talk. If you're having trouble, it's very important to recognize that this is a behavior that you're doing. It's not about who you are. So guilt is what we want. We're Jewish people. People make jokes all the time about Jewish guilt, but here guilt is good. Guilt is something you did wrong. Oh, I ate a whole pizza. I ate a whole ice cream. It's okay. You could still be a good person versus shame. I'm bad. Oh, I'm disgusting. I'm a pig. I overeat. And it's important for people to really be able to differentiate the two and just feel good about themselves. It's really what our goal is. And also be good to yourself. You know, in the 90s, Gary Chapman came out with the love languages. I'm sure people have heard, some people have heard of them before. This idea that you need to be 
do to your partner what's good for your partner, not necessarily what you like done, but think about what the other people like. Do they want words of affirmation and nice things said to them, nice things done for them, receiving gifts, spending time or physical touch? But also, people are really spending a lot of time alone with themselves in a way they haven't before. Identify what is your own self-language? How are you good to yourself? Are you saying nice things to yourself the way you say the nice to other people? Because usually people are much harder on themselves than other people. Um, and do you do things for yourself? Do you do things that feel good for yourself? Do you do actions? Can you buy yourself something that makes you feel good? Um, you know, Marie Kondo, as much as she's been telling everybody to get rid of stuff in their house, has also been teaching people that there's a joy in certain objects that we have. That if you really find something that you love, to embrace it and to recognize the joy of it. How do we spend our quality time and words of affirmation? What are the things that we're telling ourselves, not beating ourselves up with negative self-talk? So what's next? So I put these pictures up of the space station and resource centers in the North Pole, isolation wars. This, for, this is not the first time that people have been isolated. And there's been a lot of work studying different people in isolation. And there's a lot of worries going on. And part of what makes it hard, this combination of isolation and worry, is that research from isolation has showed us that there are certain patterns that people do very well knowing when things are going to end, right? So, and there's a pattern to it. People, if, they, if they're gonna be, let's say, in the space station for a year, the first 50% is typically easy. Then there's the next 35% of time where people start struggling and having a hard time. And the last 15% of the time, people know it's gonna end and they start getting back to themselves. And it's similar because when you're on an airplane, the first half seems to go really quickly when you're going on a long trip and then you're bored and like, oh my gosh, this trip has to end. And then the end, you start buckling in, you know, you put your stuff together. But we're in a little bit of a different circumstance because our time frame keeps changing. First, we have to get to Pesach. Then we have to get to the end of the school year. Now we're making it through the summer and now all the rules have changed. We don't even know where we're gonna be for the next school year. And just this ambiguity is very, it's just very hard and it's very trying. So I have two pieces of advice to leave with everyone today. The first one is, is that when we look at stress literature, we know that people who do well in stressful situations have two characteristics. One is they look at it as a challenge. How am I gonna get through this? How am I gonna work through it? And the second is to figure out where you could find control. So I suggest that everyone finds a little bit of control keeping this health in mind. And, and, and things have showed us, breast cancer survivors who start paying attention to their eating end up feeling better, that they're much more optimistic. But these little things that we do go a long way in making us being able to handle the stress. The second thing, I wanted to say in terms of how we're thinking about this narrative of this whole experience, how we're choosing to look out of it, comes out of, from Holocaust survivors in Israel. About a third of the people in Israel over the age of 75 are Holocaust survivors, about 190,000 people, some of which came in the 1940s and others came from the Soviet Union. And as COVID started, especially because the first Israeli to die was a Holocaust survivor, there was a lot of worry in Israel about how Holocaust survivors you know, with all of the trauma they've gone through, the hardship they've gone through, being isolated, how they were able to handle it. And what, what's important to note is that they are a vulnerable population and they are having a hard time, but they're a group of people that's constantly able to really talk and focus on their own personal resilience. That they're able to say like, I've gone through things before, or I'm gonna be okay, we're gonna make it through this. And the narrative that they tell that, that they've been telling each other, coming up from talking to Holocaust survivors through this time is one of resilience. So I invite everyone when they can to really acknowledge their own vulnerabilities because they're there. This is hard. This is something new for all of us, but also to find it deep inside themselves when they've been resilient before, how they've done for resilience, find the blessing of their skin needs, and really think about the strengths that they've had to go through it. And hopefully together as a community, we'll come out of this stronger. Thank you. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, does anyone have any questions? I see some thank yous in here. Um, I, uh, we have a little bit of time. So I wanted to ask you two questions, Alana, that occurred to me in this. Mm -hmm. And please feel free um, 
for anyone else who would like to uh, ask questions. One was about the sugar, fat, salt combo. Uh -huh. With David that, when we eat that stuff, does that release dopamine? I'm going back to Haley's talk now. Am I for getting sure. Okay. For sure. And definitely. And, and, and really, they give it to people and they look at their MRIs and their brains, the brains like up like they're on drugs. It's a very similar <laughs> response. That that's, and that's what the, the, that's what the comparison is made to. That it's just, that it's something that's really seen in MRIs. Okay. So then when I'm bored and I'm looking for that, you know, yeah. that chemical pick me up, that's why I'm going to go for some yummy food to like. Right. Right. Okay. And that's what processed foods have those three combinations. And it's one of the dangers of processed foods is that they're automatically added in in that large amount. So let's say you make a baked potato and you add some salt, it still won't be to the same degree as in a, in a food that you would purchase. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the other question that I had was, um, you know, oftentimes what we'll do when we are having a craving for something or we really want to eat something is we'll say, I know that this might not be so good. Oh, wait, Adi, Adi says sugar, fat, and salt with a crunch are addicting because of brain effects. Okay, they are. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, we all will often say to ourselves, I just want to have a little bit of this. And if I have a little bit, then it's going to satisfy me and I'm going to be fine. Right. So, so researchers showed, right. so researchers showed from what I read that people really get the most out of the first three bites of food that they eat and the last three food bites of food they eat. So there is something that if you have the willpower, you really could take a bite or two and get a lot of pleasure out of it and, and be done. You're testing yourself, you know, and that would be two out of your 221 decisions. Like, you know, can you walk away from it? But, but it is true. Like, and the goal is also to teach healthy balance, um, eating and to be able to eat foods you like in a good, healthy way. Going into it being hungry and starving means it would probably be very hard to control and not eat the whole thing. But the goal is to also just like enjoy your life and enjoy your food, but just do it in a good, healthy, not shameful, happy way. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was really informative and I appreciated all of the graphics that you used also <laughs> in your presentation to keep me interested. Um, well, with that, that wraps up our four fabulous speakers for today. Uh, I'm going to leave the room open, as I said, for a few minutes for those of you who would like to scroll back through the chat and copy any of the URL, URLs that were posted there. Um, this will also be posted on the KMS website for anyone who wants to go back and rewatch a portion of it or see some of the slides again. Um, it should be posted probably sometime tomorrow. Uh, and I think that that's all I, oh, and one other thing, there is a, three more speakers who will be speaking tomorrow night, Dr. Selena Snow, Dr. Lisey Levison, and Rabbi David Hochberg, Hochberg, LCSW. They are going to be speaking on parent, uh, not parenting, but on children and the effects on children, adolescents, young children, and on ourselves personally, um, some resilient strategies for all of those spaces. So uh, tomorrow night, uh, Sharon Maisel will be moderating. I believe it starts at 7.30, if I'm not mistaken. Rhonda, is that correct? You're so muted? 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. 7 o'clock. 7, 7 p.m. Okay, 7 p.m. I want to tomorrow. thank you, Laura, for moderating so sure. smoothly. I don't know, I everyone's so tech savvy. I don't know, I sent some messages. I don't know if you knew it was for me, but you're just a natural. And to thank you to the speakers who did an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable presentations to help yes. us learn more about this. Okay, everyone, and with that, thank you.